we are in Hebrews. And uh, again, thanks to Deanna for graciously sharing with us about Operation Christmas Child and, and Todd for sharing with us uh, the church finances update. Um, of course, that means we're, we don't have as much time as we normally do for the study. So, you know, I'm going to be cutting it a little short. We'll, we're not going to get all the way through chapter 7. At least I don't plan on it. We'll just kind of hit on the first few verses. We'll probably just hit on the first three verses. and um, Which works out re- really well because the first three verses of chapter 7, are, they, they kind of make for an overview of what um, is talked about through the rest of the chapter. So um, it, it, this is kind of an introduction, I guess you could say, uh, to chapter 7. So um, as I hope you remember... The author had begun a discourse on the high priesthood of Jesus all the way back in chapter 5. But then he took a detour and he exhorted his readers to move beyond the milk into the meat of God's word in Genesis, in, uh, Genesis, in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to be talking some about Genesis today, so it's on my mind. Um, and, and there in chapter 6, he challenged them to, to make a course correction and to move on to maturity. So that's what we talked about last week in chapter 6. And now he dives back into where he was going with the discourse of chapter 5 on Jesus as the great high priest. Now in that discourse, he had said that Jesus' priesthood was greater than that of the Aaronic priesthood. That's Aaronic, not ironic. The Aaronic priesthood. Um, to, To advance his point, the author quoted from Psalm 110, to reveal that Jesus' priesthood was according to the order of Melchizedek. That was uh, Hebrews 5, verse 10, where he said, according, uh, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. I'm quoting from Psalm 110. Now, the Aaronic priesthood, it had a beginning. It began when God instituted the priesthood from among Israel after they had left Egypt and entered Canaan. Um, and before they entered Canaan. Now, under this priesthood, the priests offered sacrifices for the people, but they also had to offer sacrifices for themselves. That's because they, like all of us, were sinful. So then, they had to deal with their own sin before they could deal with the sins of others. Now, there was another priesthood that predated Israel and predated the giving of the law of Moses, and were introduced to this priesthood in Genesis chapter 14. There we are told that Abraham, after rescuing his nephew Lot from a confederacy of five kings, met with Melchizedek. Let's read it now. Genesis 14, 18 through 20 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him. And said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. That is, Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, or Salim, um, and priest of God Most High. He brought out bread and wine to share with Abraham, and he he blessed Abraham. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all his plunder from that battle with those kings. Now, this is the last of the priestly order of Melchizedek that we hear about until Psalm 110. Um, And then, of course, here in Hebrews. Now, the other order of priests that we read about in the Bible is the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of the tribe of Levi was conventional to the Jewish nation. They had been selected by God to serve Israel in the tabernacle. God had selected the first high priest of this order, and that was Moses' brother Aaron. And the high priesthood was passed down as each high priest died. The priest had served God for centuries, but now the writer of Hebrews points out that their priesthood has ended. The Levitical priesthood had predated the rulership of kings in Israel. Of course, God was the original king of Israel, but the people desired a king like the other nations had. And God gave them Saul, who was very much like 
the kings the other nations had. Now, after Saul, there was David, who was a man after God's own heart, and then Solomon, who would rule in peace and, and build the temple. But overall, the majority of kings turned out to be greatly flawed, if not absolutely wicked. Now, as prophesied in Genesis 49, the authority and rule would be in the hand of the tribe of Judah. But when the Messiah came, the scepter of rule departed from Judah and rested in the hands of the king of kings, where it still resides today. Likewise, the high priesthood came to an end. And though the human institution, it wouldn't end for several years after even this letter was written, the high priesthood came to an end when the great high priest, Jesus, offered the better sacrifice. Now, of course, the Levitical line of priests came to an abrupt end with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, but in reality, it ended with Jesus' better sacrifice. So Jesus is great high priest according to a priestly order that predates the Levitical priesthood. And Jesus is king, independent of his human genealogy through the tribe of Judah since he was, as John 1 pointed out, in the beginning. Now, according to the Mosaic law, priests were not kings and kings were not priests. One was by the tribe of Levi, that is the priests, and the other by the tribe of Judah, that is the kings. In the Jewish mind, the two roles could never meet. And whenever a king took it upon himself to perform the duties of a priest, Scripture testifies to the fact that God judged them. Only in Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law, and in pre-law Melchizedek, were these two offices combined. Now, as students of the Bible, you probably recognize that name Melchizedek before I ever even mentioned it. The name means king of righteousness. He's also called king of Salem, or Salim, meaning peace. And he is king of peace. Jesus Christ is our high priest and king. But Psalms and Hebrews says that Jesus was a priest forever. He, his priesthood is everlasting. The high priests, according to the law, they were priests for life, but they all died and the priesthood had to be passed down. The Bible records no beginning for Melchizedek, nor does it record an end of his life. And that's not because he never died. There is no reason to believe that Melchizedek was anything more than just a regular mortal priest and king of Salem. And in fact, we'll see in Hebrews 7 that Melchizedek was like the Son of God. Now, there are several people in the Old Testament who were like the Son of God, or, or we could say types or foreshadowings of Christ. There's Joseph, uh, of whom the Bible records no sin, though he was certainly a sinful man. Uh, he was also not believed by his brothers, and he was sold into Gentile hands and ma later made ruler of everything. And there's David. He was 30 years old when he began to reign, just as Christ was 30 when he entered into his public ministry. And David defeated Israel's enemies, just as Christ has done for us. Both Joseph and David foreshadowed Christ in many other ways. And there are others, such as Adam, Noah, uh, Job, the, the Passover lamb, of course, uh, Gideon, Isaac. Uh, really, it, it's a very long list, and we've uh, gone into depth on this subject before, so we're not going to hit all these people. But my point is that Scripture by design only gives us details about Melchizedek that support his foreshadowing of Christ, his priesthood and kingship. If you were asked to name the most important people in the Old Testament, I doubt that Melchizedek's name would be on your list. In fact, if you were asked to name anyone in the Old Testament, I doubt Melchizedek would even be a third-tier choice for you. He's mentioned only twice in the Old Testament with Abraham, a, a couple of verses in Genesis 14, and, and later with one sentence in Psalm 110. But the Holy Spirit reached back into the Old Testament and used those two very brief mentions to present a most important truth. That truth is this. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is superior to that of Aaron because the order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Levi. And along those lines, Melchizedek was a man of whom the Bible records no beginning and no end, and that he had the office of priest 
of El Elyon, that is God Most High, and was king of Salem, or peace. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ was of the tribe of Levi. Uh, I'm sorry, Judah. was of the tribe of Judah, as the, the genealogies and the Gospels attest to. Now, Jesus was born of the seed of David, that is, the tribe of Judah. He was of the royal line, yet his kingship actually predated uh, Judah. His human lineage was the proper line for the kingship, but he could not have served as priest because he did not belong to the tribe of Levi. So then he became the sacrifice on earth that he might become the high priest in heaven. And all of these things will be further developed starting here in chapter 7 and then continuing on even through chapter 10. Now, whereas we touched on it briefly with chapter 5, the writer now uh, really digs in on this commentary on the high priesthood of Jesus. And he does it with gusto here starting in chapter 7. Uh, he addresses the superiority of the order of the, the priesthood of Melchizedek here. In, in chapter 8, he gets into Christ's better covenant. With chapter 9, he gets to Christ's better sanctuary. And with chapter 10, he concludes with the better sacrifice of Christ. These are some very important concepts that we're going to look at this morning. Um, things like, who is Melchizedek? Uh, what is his position? What is the meaning of his name or title? Uh, what is the place known as Solemn? And what is the typology associated with Melchizedek? So a lot to dig in here. And again, shorter service because of everything we had come before this morning. Uh, but we'll hit on quite a bit. So, and and I, I know this, this is a lot. This is like almost like, like trying to drink from a fire hose this morning because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be that we're going to share. Um, but again, next week we'll hit back on a lot of this stuff to refresh our, our minds. And as we dig further into chapter 7 next week, it, this will all really come together and make more sense. Um, but let's, let's start out in prayer. Lord, as we embark on this study of your word, we ask that our hearts would be open to receive all that you have. We desire to be hearers. We desire to be doers of, uh, of your word. We desire that you would lead us in your ways. And Lord, we pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Verse 1, Hebrews 7, verse 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Solomon, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. I think it's interesting how we get the impression that God only interacted with a few people at a time. Um, it goes without saying with Adam and Eve, but later when the population had grown and we read uh, about individuals God was working through, Noah and then later Abraham, and because the Bible focuses on these interactions, we get the impression that these are the only people that God was actually interacting or communicating with. But then we get to, to Genesis 14 and we discover Melchizedek. And he's not mentioned any time before this, but he is a king of Solom, which would later be Jerusalem or Jerusalem. He's also a priest of El Elyon or most, the Most High God. In other words, we discover that God was interacting with more than just Abraham and more than just the Israelite lineage that was to come. We also might conclude by Melchizedek being identified as priest of the Most High God, that he was monotheistic. In other words, he probably did not worship the gods of the Canaanites who lived in that country. There, there, there may, may be a slight twist to this, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. The big idea for the readers of this letter here is that God ordained priests well before the time of Moses. In fact, God had ordained priests before the time of Abraham. Now, we'll get back to this in a moment, but I find something else interesting here. Um, a couple of dots I want us to connect, and, and there's going to be a lot of dots to connect this morning as we 
uh, continue through this. But, but for right now, this has to do with the place where Melchizedek was priest and king. That was Solom, or Jerusalem later. In Genesis 14, Abraham, or Abram at that time, did not set foot in Solom. Melchizedek brought out bread and wine to Abraham. A few years later, Abraham became more intimately familiar with Solomon, the future Israelite city of Jerusalem. It was at Mount Moriah, which is there in the city of Jerusalem, that the Lord sent Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. The very same place where God sent his own son to actually be sacrificed centuries later. So we have here two incidents before Melchizedek. In the place where Melchizedek was priest, king, and Abraham's involved. Free Israel, free law. Ceremonial bread and wine in Genesis 14. And then the sacrifice of Genesis 22 that Christ later fulfilled. And again, these not only long before Christians existed, <laughs> but long before uh, Israel or, or any Jews or, or even the law was given. Now, back to, to the epistle or, or the letter to the Hebrews here. As I said earlier in the Old Testament, the throne and the altar were separated. Those who attempted to kind of put those two roles together, priest and king, would be judged by God. But here the author points us to a man who preceded Aaron and held both offices, king and priest. And Genesis 14 says that Abraham not only gave Melchizedek a tithe, but received a blessing from him. Now, Melchizedek, he was not just some counterfeit priest. He was the priest of the Most High God. And both Scripture and Abraham attest to the legitimacy of his ministry. In the Bible, names and their meanings are often important. Sometimes names were given as uh, a means of prophecy, and sometimes names were changed due to some critical event or some spiritual change that occurred. God changed Abraham's or Abram's name to Abraham. He added that letter, hey, changing the meaning from exalted father to father of many. Uh, he did the same thing with Sarai, changed Sarai's name to Sarah, uh, adding in the hey, uh, the Hebrew letter hey, and changed it from my princess to mother of nations. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter and so forth. Most commentators would say that the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And of course, here in, in chapter 7 of Hebrews, that is the way the author here has translated it as king of righteousness. Only in the Greek, it's actually just king righteousness. Um, there's been some additions here to help us out in the English, of course. But, you know, linguistically, when you look back at the name, you discover that it's actually proto-Semitic. And it's a conglomeration of two nouns, Malk and Zedek. And in between, there's a suffix added, E. The best translation, given that construction, would be, my king is righteous. Now, some get really literal with this and say his name is actually, my king is Zedek. And that's interesting because there was actually a Canaanite deity at the time that was named Zedek. In fact, later in Joshua 10, we find an Amorite presence in Jerusalem and a king there named Adoni Zedek having that same morphological construct, but with the first noun meaning Lord. So then the name Zedek seems to have, through time, kind of carried over. 
Now, this indicates that the name may have been a title handed down in various forms to those who ruled in Salem, or, or later Jerusalem. However, Adoni Zedek is not named as a priest in addition to being a king. So it implies that something along the lines changed. Now, Joshua 10 tells us that Adoni Zedek was an enemy of Joshua and Israel. So either something changed over the years or God was doing something more here. And the question, or the answer to the question, is that the text of Genesis 14 is not pointing us to Melchizedek. It's pointing us to Christ. And this is what the author of Hebrews wants us to understand. Melchizedek was a prefiguring of Christ, a hint, a clue. Scripture doing just what God intended it to do, pointing us to Christ. And I believe this is why the author of Hebrews translated the name Melchizedek as king of righteousness when it may have meant my king is righteous. He's making a point. He's opening up a broader picture for us. In fact, in Luke 24, when Jesus met with the disciples on the Emmaus Road after his resurrection and expounded to them all the things concerning himself in Scripture, I'm willing to bet he pointed back to Genesis 14 and Melchizedek. It may have been that Zedek was a name for, for God that was used by a group of people that, that God was at one time making himself known to. Perhaps Melchizedek was a witness of God to the people of Canaan, a light from the hill city of Solom. In fact, the Bible tells us that the people of Canaan were not ignorant of the God of Israel. Remember that Rahab told the Israelite spies, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and also said, For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. God made Himself or he had made himself known to the residents of Canaan. But they had hardened their hearts against him, and they had turned to false gods. Basically, they rejected him and his forgiveness, and God harshly judged them. So one option is that Melchizedek was priest and king of a pre-Israel Gentile city where El Elyon, or God Most High, was worshipped. The other option is that Melchizedek was priest and king of a Canaanite city where a false god called Zedek was worshipped. Of course, if that's the case, then perhaps we run into problems with Abraham's giving of a tithe to him and receiving bread and wine and a blessing. Well, really, the, the first way flows very well with Scripture, that those who had once known God had rejected him and were subject then to God's judgment by the invading Israel. But it doesn't change anything if it was the other way. It doesn't change what Psalm 110 says of Jesus or what the author of Hebrews says about Jesus and the priesthood of Melchizedek. That's because Melchizedek was a type and not the actual person. Certainly other types in Scripture had flaws. I mean, think about Joseph. He was flawed. David was certainly not perfect. Yet the Holy Spirit used both both of them to foreshadow Christ. Now, I I don't want you to get tripped up by all this detail that I'm throwing out there. I I love detail because just the the archaeologist side of me, I like to dig and I like to find out stuff. Um, Speaking of archaeological uh, investigations, Melchizedek is actually mentioned in other texts. Uh, Josephus mentions Melchizedek and and some of the... uh, uh, the Qumran scrolls mention Melchizedek. In, in uh, the Genesis Apocryphon, a, a Qumran Cave 1, Genesis 14, 18 through 20, is translated very literally. But then you get to another scroll that was found. Uh, uh, 11 Q Melk uh, is the Melchizedek text from Qumran Cave 4. And there Melchizedek is handled a bit differently. By the way, these are Dead Sea Scrolls. If you're, <laughs> I didn't throw that, that out there, but um, these are, are the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in various caves there in Qumran. Um, now, that Qumran text, 11Q Milk, 
um, it actually exists only as 13 fragments. And it is impossible to get any kind of complete reading from them. But what they've been able to gather is that it looks like it was a midrash on Isaiah 61 and Psalm 82. And it places Melchizedek as ruling over a court or congregation of divine beings and names the deliverer of Isaiah 61 as that same divine person. Now, keep in mind that these texts are outside of the Bible, and as for uh, the Melchizedek scroll, it is almost completely unreadable. Again, just 13 fragments. But what it tells us is that there was an idea of this mix of kingship and priesthood in Jewish thought in the time of the Essenes, which was 200 B.C. all the way to 1st century A.D. And that supports this idea of the Messiah being of the line or the order of Melchizedek. And of course, this is the, the idea that the author of Hebrews is presenting to us now. And as we see here, he was also king of Salem. In Salem or Salem, it means peace, shalom. So we have righteousness and peace prominently featured here, but this is not the only place that we find these two things together in Scripture. In fact, righteousness and peace are found together a lot in Scripture. Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forevermore. Psalm 85, 10, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Psalm 72, 7, in his days the righteous shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more. James 3, 17 through 18, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All this speaks to the fact that that true peace can be experienced only on the basis of righteousness. Of course, the Bible reminds us that there is none righteous, not even one. So then if we want to enjoy peace with God, we must be justified, that is, declared righteous by faith. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God gave the law not because uh, we can produce righteousness ourselves by keeping the law. Instead, he gave the law to be a schoolmaster or a tutor to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Paul said in Galatians 2, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. It is only through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that we can have true peace. Now, let's consider the fact that Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes. And we'll get much more deep into this uh, next week in verses, uh, starting with verse 4. But that word tithe means one-tenth. And under the Jewish law, the Jews were commanded to give one-tenth of their crops, of their herds, and their flocks. Um, you know, to those under the law, Leviticus 27, 30 through 32 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy to the Lord. So these tithes were brought to the Levites at the tabernacle and later at the temple. If the trip was, was too long to transport all those things, the grain, the fruits, the animals, um, then the law actually allowed for, for those things to be converted into money to make it easier to move. But you know, tithing, as we see here, didn't originate with Moses. Abraham practiced tithing long before the law was given. In fact, archaeologists have discovered that other nations also tithed in that day, so the practice is really an ancient one. So then this begs the question, what does faithful giving look like under grace? Well, for this, we might look to an example in the New Testament, as well as consider what the New Testament text explicitly says about tithing. Um, a similar thing to Abraham and Melchizedek happened when Jesus had dinner with Zacchaeus. Luke 19 records Jesus in Jericho. 
and a tax collector named Zacchaeus climbed a tree so that he might see Jesus above the crowds. And Jesus saw him there and beckoned him to come down. And then Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. Now, in that text, Jesus brought the favor of God to a man who didn't deserve it. And the effect, the result of that, is that Zacchaeus said to Jesus, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. No one commanded Zacchaeus to give. Jesus wasn't teaching a 12-part series on it. Nobody guilted him into it. He was not giving to manipulate Jesus into giving back to him. It was a spontaneous and joyful act made in response to grace. You know, tithing's mentioned only a few times in the New Testament. Jesus acknowledged that the Pharisees, that they were very careful about their tithing, but he criticized the importance they placed on it Above mercy, love, justice, and faithfulness. And then, of course, tithing is mentioned here in Hebrews. Well, there's been a change of priesthood. And the New Testament presents us with no laws of tithing. Instead, the New Covenant admonishes Christians to give what they can with a joyful heart. The Old Covenant made giving a matter of exact numbers and percentages according to the law. The New Covenant makes giving a matter of the heart according to grace and faith. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, So let each one give as as he purposes in in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're going to wrap it up with what verse 3 says here real quick. Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains continually. Okay, so Melchizedek is eternal, right? No. Melchizedek was as far as we can get from the plain meaning of all texts in the Bible about him, just a man. I mean, yeah, there's that one incomplete Qumran text that seems to say something otherwise, but remember, that's not biblical canon, and that's only 13 fragments of text. We might point to verse 4 of the chapter, where it refers to him as a man. The problem, though, is that it doesn't actually occur in the, in the actual text. It's added because it's implied. It's still not there, so we really can't use it. But if we look at verse 3, we find a Greek word that's translated like and means to be likened to. The author of Hebrews says that Melchizedek was to be likened to Christ. He is not Christ. Bless you. (laughs) The author uses him as an analogy, just as Paul in Galatians used Isaac and Ishmael as an analogy of the two covenants of Galatians 4. Melchizedek is type, and Christ is the antitype. As we saw with Joseph, Jacob, and David, we don't have to have apples to foreshadow apples. We can have an orange that, when in certain light, looks like an apple to foreshadow an apple. And I believe that's what's going on here. Melchizedek was likened to Christ, but Melchizedek was not Christ. He was quite simply a regular man, a king, a priest of Solomon, pre-Israel, who may or may not have worshipped the one true God. He was recorded in Scripture to fit God's purpose of foreshadowing the Savior that was to come, Jesus Christ. He had a mother, he had a father but there's no record of his genealogy in the Old Testament. Now, this is significant because most well-known persons in the Old Testament have their ancestry identified. And because the law stated that the ancestry of one's priesthood must come from a priestly line, 
it was very important that the priests be able to prove their ancestry. And so we have here the writer of Hebrews using an argument from silence. We know no more of the line of Melchizedek after Genesis 14. Nonetheless, it's a valid line. Melchizedek was not an angel or some super, superhuman creature. He wasn't a Christophany. Uh, that is a, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. He was a real man. He was a real king. He was a real priest in a real city. But as far as the record of Scripture is concerned, there is nothing about his birth or his death. And in this way, he is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal, preexistent Son of God. And though Jesus Christ did die, Calvary was not the end. Jesus rose from the dead, and today he lives in the power of an endless life. And since there's no account of Melchizedek's death, as far as the record is concerned, it's as if Melchizedek is still serving as priest and king. So this is another way in which he is like the eternal Son of God. Neither Aaron nor any of his descendants could claim to be without genealogy. And they could not claim to have an endless ministry. Nor could they claim to be both kings and priests like Jesus Christ. So, shorter service this morning, but I think we did a good job of laying the groundwork for the remainder of our study through Hebrews. Hopefully connecting some dots. If not, if, if some of this didn't quite make sense to you, or, or threw you for a bit of a loop, don't worry, next week we'll hit on a little bit more, probably clear up some of those things. Um, I know some of those dots are a little bit hard to connect in the mind unless you're actually spending, you know, I get to spend hours uh, looking at this, and then I, I have to try and put it all together into something that takes only 40, 45 minutes or an uh, hour and 20 minutes, depending on how long I want to go. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, hopefully it, it makes some sense for you guys. And uh, again, if not, we will be sure to, to clarify what, what remains cloudy next week as we continue in Hebrews chapter 7. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that um, we thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And we thank you that, uh, that, that salvation is not a work or not something we achieve, that it's uh, uh, something that, that we are given by grace, Lord, through faith. Lord, I want to lift up to you um, Alex's family and ask that you would bring them comfort through this incredibly difficult time. Um, also, Lord, that, that you would open the door to uh, the gospel through this uh, into their lives, Lord. And Father, we also want to lift up those in Houston who are dealing with this, this terrible hurricane that has hit um, and, and just ask that you would show us if there's any way that we can be uh, a, a helping hand to them, Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time in your word. And we love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.